All right, our next presenter is Mike uh, Osman, who I've known on Twitter for a while and uh, just finally met in person. So he's going to be talking about uh, his new hardware system, the Hack RF. Crashes X every time. Close enough. Yay. You can almost see the whole screen. All right, I'm Michael Osman, and I have a little company called Grace Scott Gadgets. Um, probably not, I don't know too many of you guys. Um, I've been kind of a lurker in the GNU radio community for a long time. Um, I'm more active in the information security community. And so, uh-oh. Hey, how about that? You can see the whole screen. Uh, thanks, man. Uh, so uh, if you have, if you are familiar with my work at all, probably what you've heard of me, uh, what you've heard of is, um, oh, yeah, before I get to that, I'll explain a little later why, why this is in here. Um, if you have heard of me, it's because you've maybe seen the Ubertooth One, which is a special purpose uh, USB dongle for uh, Bluetooth security work and uh, passive Bluetooth monitoring. Um, and that arose out of um, some work that I did with Dominic Spill a few years ago, actually using GNU Radio and the USRP to do a bunch of uh, Bluetooth stuff. We figured out how to do passive Bluetooth monitoring and and all channel monitoring we actually implemented with a USRP2 uh, and with kind of a crazy hack. And um, eventually, out of that, um, I found that in the information security community, a lot of people were really excited about that and then never used it um, because they didn't have uh, the, the hardware. And they wanted something, in, in order to be able to do this kind of Bluetooth security work, they wanted something that was smaller and more portable and more cost effective. And uh, so that's why I came up with the Ubertooth One. And once I designed it, uh, people wanted to buy it. And that's how my company got started. Uh, I also, you might have also seen the Throwing Star Land Tap. Um, and if you, ha if you don't, haven't received a business card from me yet today, um, find me sometime this week and grab one. Uh, also, you might have seen the IMME Spectrum Analyzer uh, firmware that I wrote for the, the Girl Tech IMME. It's so cool and so connected. Um, I bought that thing for $15, and uh, right now I think it, it, it's in a factory in China because I sent it to them to use as a uh, uh, test instrument. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, it actually works. Um, so, and I'm very active in the information security community, including uh, this, in a, what is it, like three weeks? In October, I'll be doing a SDR workshop at TourCon. It's a hacker conference in, in San Diego. And this is, I think, the fourth year that I've done this. Um, so, uh, you know, if, you, if you're interested or if you know people who are interested in getting into software radio for the first time, this is a good introduction for them. And I really focus on uh, the information security community and, and bringing people who who know things about software security uh, but don't necessarily know things about RF and DSP. And it's this two-day crash course where I have a, a big focus on kind of security applications for SDR. Uh, but a lot of it's really just DSP and SDR fundamentals. Um, the, uh, the information security field is an area where software radio is a 
very much a proven technology. And this is, this is very interesting to me because a lot of what people in the SDR community do, and probably some of the folks in this room, uh, is work towards kind of far, further distant applications, and like potential consumer use, and all the white spaces stuff, and cognitive radio, and, and there's a lot of focus on this stuff that's, that's a little bit farther off, but meanwhile, SDR has been used in a number of fields, like on the ground, day to day, uh, it's super useful, and information security is, a, is one of those fields. Wireless communication security research has been using SDR like crazy over the last few years, and a lot of the new technologies that have, that have been invented to do security things, like testing the security of miscellaneous wireless systems, um, a lot of that stuff is done with SDR, and um, but then it hasn't necessarily seen a lot of deployment in the field. The actual people who are like on the ground doing doing penetration tests, for example, uh, don't probably carry around SDR hardware with them, and maybe they'd like to. So, uh, so the HackRF project kind of arose out of this concept of maybe it would be it would be nice to have a, a piece of hardware that would allow people in the field uh, who are security practitioners uh, to be able to kind of do these kind of jobs like, like uh, assessments of m random miscellaneous unexpected wireless digital systems. Uh, so one of the things that I've really gone for with this project is to try to make it as low cost as possible. I want it to be something that uh, any penetration tester can just throw in their laptop bag and carry around with them. It should be very portable. Um, it should fit in their laptop bag. It shouldn't require a wall wart. They shouldn't have to look around for a, uh, a power socket. Uh, it should be just powered right off the laptop. And um, open source. The information security community in particular has a, places a very high value on open source software and hardware. Uh, they like to be able to audit what they're using. They like to be able to modify what they're using. And so the HackRF project is 100% open source software and hardware. Um, in fact, today you can download all our in development uh, hardware designs and uh, firmware and everything. Uh, it's all on GitHub. And um, you can download stuff and build your own boards and build these things if you want. Um, we're shooting our, our, our official target operating frequency range is 100 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. Uh, we'll probably actually uh, beat the 100 megahertz low end by quite a bit. I've, I've been testing down to around 10 megahertz, and things work okay down there. So it's going to be really low to really high all in one device. Uh, we're shooting for 20 megahertz bandwidth. Really, our, our limitation here is high speed USB. So we're going with USB. Uh, high speed 2.0 uh, because that is very common and low cost. Um, we're using 8 bit samples, so 20 megahertz is about our theoretical maximum that we'll get over USB. We might actually get somewhat left, so like 15 or 16 megahertz. Um, we've been doing most of our testing at 10 and uh, so far, and so we'll, we'll probably end up in the teens or maybe 20 tops. Um, and we want it to be a transceiver, and this is very important. Uh, especially in the in the security space, we want to be able to to sniff around and find different things, uh, different signals, and uh, then potentially try to emulate them, replay them, synthesize new ones, do brute force attacks, all kinds of things like that. And we want all these things to be in a single device, but we can live without certain things. High dynamic range. I, I think I mentioned we're dealing with 8-bit samples. That's that's pretty low compared to a lot of the hardware you guys are used to. Um, but uh, as the Realtek dongles have, have made us realize recent, recently, you can do a lot with 8 bits, right? It's not ideal, but you can do a lot with it. Um, we can live without DSP on the device itself because everybody's carrying around these laptops already that have a huge amount of processing power in them. Uh, so we can, we can get by without having a specialized DSP device or FPGA uh, on the board. And we can live without full duplex, typically. And so we're, we're just targeting a half duplex transceiver right now. So this is what it looks like. Um, 
This board is called codenamed Jawbreaker, and I just soldered it on Friday. Uh, <laughs> this is really fresh stuff. You guys are the first to see it. Um, it's uh, it's about a little less than three by six inches right now, and that includes a little PCB antenna over there. Um, the PCB antenna may seem kind of silly. It's like a 900 megahertz antenna, and we're targeting this huge frequency range. But th the idea is that we're going to have a, a beta test where we make a whole bunch of these boards and give them out to people and try to uh, get a lot of people to try them and give us feedback on the design and hopefully improve uh, the design. And uh, the, the PCB antenna allows people to just take the board, plug it into USB, and start doing some things in the 900 megahertz ISM band without having to have any additional antennas or connectors or anything. Um, and if you want, you can just cut the trace to the PCB antenna and plug in an antenna into the little SMA connector there instead. Uh, so there's a little bit of extra space there on the board for that. Um, the, uh, up until Friday, what this project looked like was this. Uh, it was a lot messier and bigger. It barely fit on top of my notebook <laughs> to take the photo. So uh, actually, you can kind of see them side by side here. Um, so that was a, a group of multiple boards. And right now, the, the jawbreaker design is, is basically the same as this, electrically the same as this group of boards that I had, just all condensed into one board. So the architecture, the hardware architecture, is a dual conversion with a high IF, a high intermediate frequency, and a USB microcontroller to get samples in and out of a host computer with flexible clock generation. So it looks, the block diagram looks like this. We have a, an antenna connected to a wideband front end, connected to an intermediate frequency transceiver, connected to the ADC DAC, connected to a microcontroller with high speed USB. So the intermediate frequency you can see there is, is in the 2.3 to 2.7 gigahertz range, which is super high compared to most systems that have an intermediate frequency. And the reason we use that high IF uh, is basically to take advantage of, of some, uh, take advantage of a particular transceiver IC that looked really attractive for this application. It also means that we can get, we can reach way above and way below that intermediate frequency without, you know, we can get up to six gigahertz, for example, without having to have a absurdly or impractically high uh, local oscillator in our wideband front end. So the wideband front end has its own mixer. So we're converting between, that's the dual conversion. There's one conversion in the wideband front end that converts between the RF and the IF, and then there's a second conversion in the intermediate, sorry, intermediate frequency transceiver that converts between the IF and baseband. And baseband is, you know, uh, um, analog I and Q that's uh, being sampled by the ADC DAC. The, uh, I've highlighted, so I'm just going to kind of go through the hardware design at this point and uh, tell you about where we are in the design and how everything fits together. The highlighted area is the microcontroller. We're using the LPC4300 microcontroller from MXP. It's an ARM Cortex-M4, and it isn't particularly micro. Uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's 144 pins, and it's actually dual core. Uh, it has a, a Cortex-M0 coprocessor, which is pretty nifty. Uh, we're not actually using that yet, but we probably will down the road. Uh, the, the, what's micro about it is that it's, it is um, pretty inexpensive. It's like, I don't know, $7 or something like that in quantity. So uh, it has high-speed USB built in, and that was kind of the, the, the most important feature we were looking for, is to have a microcontroller that would, that, uh, would be able to talk to the host computer over high-speed USB. And it also has this interesting peripheral called SGPIO, serial GPIO, which is a, um, a way of manipulating the, the pins um, on the microcontroller to, to, inter, to implement a parallel interface or a serial inter interface. And the nice thing about it is that it can be externally clocked. So we have this 
flexible parallel interface that can be externally clocked on our microcontroller. Um, this, this microcontroller can operate up to 204 megahertz and it has the coprocessor and the Cortex M4 actually has DSP instructions. So there is some potential here to do a little bit of DSP on our microcontroller, which is pretty nifty, but it's not really our, our goal. Our goal is just to get samples in and out of the host computer and let people do DSP there. But uh, since we have this capability, we may be able to do some DSP stuff eventually uh, on this microcontroller as well, which, which would be pretty cool in an FPGA-less design. Uh, to be able to do any DSP at all, uh, we think is a win. Uh, so I, now I've highlighted this, this next section, which is the analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter. Actually, the, the ADC and DAC are all on that little chip, the higher one. The lower, the bigger lower chip is a CPLD that I'll talk about in a second. Um, so the, the, the little chip is the MAX5864. It has dual ADC, dual DAC. So that gives us our I and Q. Um, digital to analog and, uh, and vice versa. The reason we have that CPLD there is because the MAX5864 has a, a DDR, a double data rate uh, interface, and interfacing that with the, with the microcontroller was a little bit tricky. Uh, it looks like we can actually remove that from the design in future versions, that CPLD, which would be nice. But for now, we're leaving it in there, and we're going to leave it in for this beta board so people who are getting a beta board can experiment with that if they want, even though it'll probably, uh, it'll probably go away in the future. The, the CPLD is, is, if you're not familiar with CPLDs, they're, they're kind of like mini FPGAs. It does not have enough logic to do DSP. Don't even think about trying to do any significant uh, signal processing there. But what it does allow us to do is create interfaces. So if, for example, you wanted to use uh, that, that uh, one of those connectors, uh, those headers around the CPLD there uh, and reprogram the CPLD. You could, for example, create an interface to an external FPGA board, something like that. That kind of thing would be possible with the CPLD. Uh, so then the next section is the IF transceiver, the intermediate frequency transceiver. And this is pretty much just uh, one chip here. It's the MAX2837. And like I mentioned before, this is a big part of why we ended up using the high IF is just so that we could use this chip. Um, and some of you have probably seen or recognized this. It looks familiar because uh, it's in the same family of parts from Maxim that is on the, um, uh, what's the name of that daughter board? The x 2450, right? The, uh, um, from the Edis daughter board. Uh, has an, a similar part from the same family from Maxim. So if you've, you've used that before, it has the same kinds of capabilities. And this is, this is really where we have um, the, uh, the limitation of being half duplex uh, really comes from this part primarily. Then one of the great things about it is that it has adjustable gain and adjustable baseband filters. So it has a whole bunch of different baseband filters that you can select from which allow you to do, um, like you can set your channel filter really low and then do a, a, a decimation with less processing, for example, because you don't have to do as much digital, digital filtering. And then the last section is the wideband front end, and it consists primarily of this part, the RFFC 5072, which is uh, an, a mixer, combined with an, a uh, frequency synthesizer. So uh, we also have these switchable image reject filters. We have a high pass path and a low pass path. We have switchable amplifier up front uh, for both receive and transmit. All this stuff can be bypassed. You can bypass the, the <coughs> amplifier section if you want. You can also bypass the whole filter and mixer section if you want, which basically gives you a straight line from the, the IF all the way out to the antenna port. So you can operate in that 2.3 to 2.7 gigahertz band without any of this front end stuff getting in your way, which is kind of nice. And uh, this whole thing is uh, kind of built around this 
center section, the, uh, which is the clock generator, we're using the SI5351C uh, from Silicon Labs, which is a clock generator. It has an onboard crystal, but it also has the capability to be driven by an external reference. So that's actually an aspect of the board that hasn't really been tested yet, uh, but the uh, clock generator supports that, and so we put headers on the board where you can bring in a, an external clock and, and use that to clock everything in the system. So instead of having a separate clock source for all these different components, um, we gain potential functionality and we also reduce cost by, by getting them all derived from a single clock source. Um, so I've had a bunch of help on this project and I want to thank people who are involved. In particular, uh, Jared Boone is kind of my right, man, right hand man on the project and he has a company called ShareBrain Technology where uh, he's doing all kinds of open source hardware stuff too. Uh, DARPA Cyber Fast Track is, uh, I don't, how many of you guys have heard of the Cyber Fast Track program? Anybody? Okay, like a half a dozen people. Um, it's very well known now within the information security community, which is the community that it targets. It, it's a program to uh, fund small independent research projects. And uh, so DARPA, through the Cyber Fast Track program, is actually funding this development effort to produce an open source hardware design for, uh, for HackRF. And one of the things that uh, that DARPA is is funding is actually building a bunch of hardware for uh, for this beta test and so I don't know the exact terms uh, that I'll be able to offer this beta hardware under but it's going to be really really low cost or <laughs> free um, so actually I was wondering Tom could I bug you to uh, pass these out so I'm actually gonna have Tom pass out one to everybody uh, these little invitations um, and I put a little code on there. Like I said, I don't know yet the, the full terms of how the beta is going to work, so I can't guarantee you anything, but hang on to this card and hang on to your code on there and don't give it away because at some point over the coming weeks, uh, I'll be announcing, hey, the beta is available and here's what you do to get your board. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, I think I showed you the, um, you know, the, the, the jawbreaker board that I've been showing you on several slides. It's actually the, probably this board as is with very minor modifications to fix a couple things uh, will be the beta board. And uh, we'll be getting it out to as many people as we can and, tr and trying to solicit feedback and uh, get more people involved in this open source hardware project. Um, I also want to call out uh, Bit Systems, which is the administrator of the Darber Cyber, Cyber Fast Track program, uh, and Benjamin Vernu and Will Code are a couple of guys who just like showed up in our IRC channel and started writing code for the project, which is great. And so I started sending them hardware. And uh, David Holton, who is the founder of TourCon, is somebody that I've known for a long time, uh, is the person who kind of kicked me and said, "Mike, you've been talking about." doing something like this for years, why don't you just apply for a, for a DARPA Cyber Fast Track and see if we can get this project done and uh, into people's hands. And so that's what we're doing. Um, the, uh, the URL, greatscottgadgets.com slash hackrf. If you, uh, and that, I think, I, I put that URL on the invitation, didn't I? So everybody has that already, I think. Yes, no? Okay, good. So that's the place to go uh, just to find out, just to keep up to date, that's kind of the central location for all information about HackRF. And when information becomes available about the, the beta program, that's where it will be posted um, first. And with that, uh, are there any questions? All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.